Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Gina Smarecki and I'm the events manager here at Newsfire and I will be your host for today's live session. Today's webinar is always a popular topic as we look at Newsfire's Q1 threat report findings. We're excited to share insights on the current trends in cybercrime. Also, you can get the full threat landscape report, which is now available to download from our website. Um, so I will go ahead and share that in the chat box right now for everyone. So with summer coming up, we thought we would do something fun and give away gas gift cards to five lucky registrants. So watch your email in the coming days. I'll be notifying those winners. Just a couple of housekeeping items before we do introductions. Um, if you have questions for today's presenters, please pop them into that questions tab on the right corner of your screen, the bottom corner there. Uh, what we'll do is collect all your questions and address them at the end in the Q&A session. Um, also, just so you know, everyone will receive a follow-up email uh, after this with a link to watch the recording just in case you missed anything. So. Um, at this time, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to our speakers today, Josh Smith and Justin Hurd. Josh is a cyber threat analyst here at Newsfire who works closely in organizational threat landscapes, curating threat intelligence, and authoring Newsfire's quarterly threat landscape report. Josh is currently pursuing his master's degree in cybersecurity technology. Previously, he served with the U.S. Navy as an operations specialist with 14 years of service there, and he has been quoted in Forbes, CSO Online, Channel Futures, Dark Reading, and others. Justin is our manager of threat intelligence, and he works to develop and deliver intelligence at Newspire. He has over 13 years of experience in the cybersecurity industry and has developed methodologies and tools for industry-based threat modeling. Justin previously worked six years for a defense contractor as a security engineer and network administrator. And now I'll go ahead and turn it over to Josh and Justin. Thank you very, very much for the warm welcome. Uh, it's certainly appreciated and thank you everyone for joining us. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're at in the world. Uh, quick little overview of what our agenda is. Uh, we're gonna cover some methodology and overview of kind of how we come up with this data and uh, what our processes are behind that. Uh, we're going to take a look at three different data sets uh, throughout Q1. We're going to look specifically at malware. We're going to look at botnet data and exploit data. At the end of each one of those sections, we'll cover some different mitigations and proactive things you can do about that. Um, we're also going to highlight, this is something new that we're starting to do this year, and we, we want to do it each uh, one of our quarterly threat reports. So we want to highlight a specific industry vertical and just kind of take some time to talk about some different threat actors that target it. And if you come back again next quarter, you'll see a different industry vertical there, and we'll kind of keep cycling through these. Um, then ultimately, we'll wrap this all up with a bow with some conclusions and recommendations. Hello, and uh, thank you. So it started off, we're kind of going to go over the methodologies and overviews. Uh, so what we do to kind of collect this data, and what we do as a threat intelligence team to kind of collect this uh, information. Uh, so it's going to look very familiar to the threat intelligence lifecycle. Uh, we're gathering, processing, uh, detecting with the data we find. We evaluate that data and then ultimately disseminate it to our customers. Uh, so for the uh, gathering portion uh, is the concatenation of all the data that we find, a lot of it is from devices that we manage. Uh, so think of all of our devices as huge honeypots that collect IPS, AB, um, data on the traffic, command control data, botnets, so on and so forth. We process that data, um, we use a scoring technique for that data based off of how many different vendors have seen it, um, how many times we've seen it, and what the validity is of that particular indicator. And then we're gonna detect using that information. So a lot of the information that we gather during these processes is used uh, to detect things on the network through the SIM. Uh, we'll evaluate that information, uh, further scoring and tracking those threats to see where trends are going, which is kind of where this report comes into as in you know, what are we seeing uh, throughout the threat landscape. And then the final part of that is disseminating, getting all that information out to our customers uh, and to the right stakeholders so they can take action on it. 
We'll go ahead and we'll hop right into it. Uh, one thing to note, uh, this is uh, from Q or NewSpire's perspective for Q1. This is sourced from billions of logs from uh, our own devices and client devices. And uh, to build these trends of what we've seen uh, over time from our, uh, our lens. So as we take a look specifically at Q4 to Q1, uh, we saw about a 4.76% increase in activity when it came to malware variants. Uh, specifically, we saw 1,342 unique variants and if we break down the detections to about a daily stance, it's about 40,000 a day that we're detecting slash blocking. Look at our top five specifically here that came out of Q1. Uh, VBA agents, which we'll talk about a little bit more in depth here in a moment, uh, it still remains one of our top offenders that we see. Uh, one thing we did see start to happen in Q1, though, we'll also dig into here in a little bit, is that JavaScript activity specifically is increasing. And we'll, we'll jump into why we think we're seeing that happening. Another big one, though, to call out here is still password protected files. Uh, we're still seeing a lot of those, and those are often utilized because of the encryption over them. It makes it difficult for uh, different AVs and things of that nature to see what's behind it. Um, and then they use the social engineering tactics to try to entice the user to enter in a password and then execute whatever the malicious payload is behind it. So VBA agents, uh, VBA agents, as I mentioned again, are one of the top offenders we've consistently seen here for a while, but that might be changing here. So uh, Microsoft came out during Q1 and announced that they're gonna be making it much more difficult for users to basically enable macros. Uh, I'm sure most folks here are familiar, you've opened up an Excel file, a Word document, and that little banner pops up at the top of your screen and it's trying to entice you to enable macros. Um, that's great if it's a, a legitimate file, but threat actors know very much how to abuse that and to put in malicious scripts. Um, they'll use all types of different methods to try to get a user to interact with that, whether it's say, hey, you need to click this and it's going to lead you to you know, the file you actually need or whatever their tactic is there. So Microsoft's going to make that much more difficult. Uh, starting in April, they rolled this out already to their beta users. Um, the full version to all users has not been rolled out yet and will be coming out in the future. But basically, instead of having that little banner pop up that you can click, uh, users will now have to actually go to the file, right click on it, go into the properties of it and check macro, you know, enable macros in there. Makes it much more difficult. Uh, social engineers could still find ways to try to build that into the language of you know, their, their lure, but it's, a, it's something that most users probably aren't so common with and it's not as easy just to click. Right around the time of that announcement, you can see that big dip we had as, as activity was kind of trending up. That's right about the time that announcement came out. And after that, we're starting to see VBA agent uh, activity start to decrease. And it's very likely it's the threat actors knowing that this uh, attack vector is not going to be so easy to exploit anymore, and they're shifting their tactics. So the question then becomes, where are they shifting their tactics to? If we jump over to JavaScript agents, we are seeing a huge increase in JavaScript in uh, specifically even right around that February timeframe when that announcement came out. Now, can't 100% confirm that that's what this activity means because there's also a botnet uh, campaign that we'll talk about here in a future slide that does kind of correlate with this activity. But nonetheless, it does line up with suspicions that threat actors will be shifting tactics away to something that's gonna be more viable for them. Um, one good thing about JavaScript, uh, most users will recognize when that lands in their mailbox that this isn't a file format that they're familiar with. Um, it's not typically used very commonly, you know, through email and, and organizations. So hopefully that'll at least remind users like, hey, there's, there's something weird with this file and hopefully won't click onto it. Um, as you're looking at your cybersecurity awareness programs and uh, your end user awareness training, it's something to give them a heads up about though and let them know that if they're seeing those weird JavaScript files, or again, anything that they're not expecting, they really need to be suspicious about it. Um, there's a uh, quote from CISA, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure and Security Agency, uh, that came out uh, right around the time that they released their Shields Up campaign that said, 90% of all successful cyber attacks start from a phishing email. So keep that in mind, phishing is still very, very important to talk to your users about, and specifically how trends are developing. Um, one more thing I'll piece in with that too is to make sure your folks know how to properly report those things throughout your organization. And they're not just leaning over to their coworker and saying, hey, does this, does this file look sketchy who may not have any more experience than they do? So 
ultimately keep up on that user awareness training and make sure they know how to properly report things to the proper teams. Uh, the, so the good news about all this is that there's stuff that we can do about it to help us. Uh, so endpoint protection or EPP uh, is always a good method uh, for helping uh, not just catch the malware, uh, but maybe the tactics and techniques that the malware uses to either move laterally or uh, do privilege escalation and things of that nature. Uh, network segregation is so important. Um, you know, it's the difference between a, you know, small outbreak and a huge uh, devastating business stopping outbreak uh, with, without proper network segregation. Uh, and then finally, Josh kind of touched on this is cybersecurity awareness uh, is, is probably going to be a topic on a lot of these things is just knowing what to look for, uh, knowing what the threat actors are doing to try to um, gain access into your network. Uh, is just going to go a long way when it comes to, to stopping things. Because at the end of the day, even with a layered approach, uh, there's, there's going to be a way. Uh, and that way is probably going to be through the user. We'll jump over into our botnet section. So as we take a look in comparison against Q4, we did see a 12% increase in activity. Uh, broke down to about 45 unique botnets with uh, about just, just shy of 10,000 detections per day. Out of our top five, Andromeda botnets, one that we've seen pretty commonly, and if you uh, have been to any of our previous webinars, probably be very familiar with that name. Uh, some of the ones that jumped out at us this quarter, though, and we're going to take a little bit more of a, a look at and discussion about, is the Straw Rat in the Mirai botnet, uh, specifically based on some of the activity we witnessed. So uh, Straw Rat uh, is a botnet that really particularly utilizes a lot of JavaScript. So that also keys up with that previous JavaScript slide and that spike in activity. Uh, there was a confirmed campaign uh, that was uh, mentioned by Fortinet uh, right around this time frame. It was late January when they made the announcement that they were witnessing that. Um, shortly after, we witnessed it here at Newspire too, seeing the attempts. Um, typically, they deploy via phishing using JavaScript. And once they do, uh, their malware can do all kinds of different things from information stealing, uh, key logging. Uh, it can harvest credentials out of browsers, folks who are saving the Google Chrome and Firefox browsers. Um, it can take all those kinds of information and, and, uh, and send it back to them to be utilized. From there, they can also, if they decide they want to, they can resell that connection to different ransomware operators and allow them to execute ransomware at that point. So Mirai Botnet's another one that's been around for a bit. Um, they're notorious for specifically seeking out Internet of Things devices. Um, one of the things that we did see uh, happening during Q1 was specifically they were looking at the Spring for Shell exploit that came out. Um, that came out earlier in the year, and uh, they were seen to be scanning specifically for devices that were exposed to the Internet that were vulnerable. Um, if they found those, uh, right around that same February time frame too as the other campaigns, uh, we saw uh, the execution there at that point of where they'll they'll take over devices and add them to their botnet. Uh, once they build a large enough group, they will resell those to allow um, other threat actors to perform denial of service attacks, or they can go ahead and utilize it for themselves. Another thing they'll take a look at too, if they've gained access to a device, is to see, as we talk back about network segmentation again, how far can they get from that Internet of Thing device? Is it segmented and segregated off to a very specific small corner of the network to where it's just a couple of IoT devices? Or, hey, this IoT device actually gets back to the entire network. And at that point, they can sell that connection to other threat actors. Uh, so for uh, botnets, mitigated in response, a uh, big part of this is so botnet is kind of is a tool uh, for the attackers to use to either uh, control malware that's already on your systems or just to see what's out there or like in the case of Mirai or, or Mirai botnet that they're using as a DDoS to stop, um, you know, stop your business, slow down things. Uh, and so it can be pretty impactful in that way. A uh, big way to, to mitigate botnets here is to leverage a threat intelligence. And so we're talking about uh, more tactical threat intelligence like IPs, uh, that go back to botnet infrastructure, but there is still some, you know, operational and strategic things that we can do to be prepared for the types of botnets that we may see. 
Uh, next generation uh, antivirus, so a firewall with an AV um, uh, subscription on that's able to kind of catch uh, the different types of activity that may come you know, in internal from your network outbound. So maybe a command and control or command and control trying to come into your network uh, or DDoS protection, which is also something that can be on those devices, uh, can be helpful as well. Uh, and then the last one we have here is Threat Hunt. Um, and what that is, is, you know, once we have some information, rather than tactical, uh, intelligence, strategic, or operational, we have something to go look into our infrastructure to see if it exists. Uh, so does, does one of these botnet IPs exist within my network? Uh, do I see suspicious activity, um, you know, moving laterally from device to device? Uh, and then we can start tracking those uh, TTPs uh, that may be used as part of uh, the, the kill chain with the botnet uh, command and control. Jump over into our exploit section. Um, what we witnessed here is about a 3.87% increase in activity when we compared that against Q4. Uh, That's roughly about six, uh, 639 unique exploits in a breakdown of 237,000 exploits detected or blocked per day. So as we look at the top five here specifically, uh, brute forcing has dominated once again. Um, it's not super uncommon in terms of seeing it uh, take such high numbers because of the attempts that are utilized within brute force. Uh, but the point is, is uh, it, it, we'll to get a little bit more into brute forcing here and some different things we'll talk about. Um, uh, what you should, should know as far as the, that kind of exposure with your network. Um, another thing, though, that it did dominate very, very quickly was Log4j. Uh, I'm sure most people who paid attention to any form of cybersecurity headlines are familiar with that name at this point. Uh, for it just coming out in December, though, uh, it is still dominating the attempts. Um, it very quickly jumped into our top five list and has remained there since. Um, and then something else of interest to point out, too, is uh, even old exploits, something like Double Pulsar, which came out around 2017, is still very much being actively uh, attempted to exploit. So brute forcing, uh, one thing specifically uh, to look at is, um, took a look at Shodan, and I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but Shodan basically is, uh, you could think of it as a way that you can uh, Google different devices that are exposed out to the internet. You can type in a port number, you can type in a vulnerability, and it'll basically give you a list of all these different things that are exposed out on the internet. Uh, so I took a look after we saw our brute forcing numbers, and uh, as of uh, when I created this report, uh, probably about a month ago or so when I started writing it, um, about 1.3 million different SMB ports that are mostly concentrated within the United States that are exposed. Then there's over 22 million uh, SSH ports that are currently exposed. Um, the SSH uh, is a little more understanding, I suppose, because you can have different cert-based authentication. But uh, ultimately, a lot of these things, if it's not utilizing something like the cert-based, really shouldn't be exposed out there to the world. Uh, threat actors are scanning consistently, nonstop, looking for these different things. And just being exposed like that gives a threat actor 1.3 million devices to just go through and attempt to try exploits against. Uh, it probably doesn't take them very long to get down the list before they find something they can compromise. The majority of threat actors out there who are financially motivated, uh, they're looking for low-hanging fruit. They really want the biggest payout for the least amount of effort they have to put into it. And something like an exposed service is definitely a place that they're going to start. We jump into Log4j. Um, Log4j is definitely one of the largest uh, vulnerabilities that we've had in recent history. Um, activity has still remained fairly high uh, compared to a lot of the other types of exploit attempts that, uh, that we see here. So it's interesting how uh, all this even developed of where, if you're not familiar with the history on it, a, a security researcher was basically playing around with a Minecraft server and discovered that he could modify Minecraft server and do different things like that. Um, and then when he released that information out, uh, other people kind of caught on board and said, well, wait a minute. Uh, actually, this is the Apache Log4j library, the underneath thing that you're uh, exploiting here to, to modify these Minecraft servers. And then it kind of started spiraling out of control when, when the internet figured out just how many services utilize this Log4j. And so because of that, that put a lot of different organizations at risk almost immediately because 
tons of different software and applications and things like that utilize this library. So what can we learn from this really is uh, more that we have to stay on top of our technology stacks and make sure that we do understand what exactly is being utilized. So if something like this does come out, you immediately can catch that headline and get your patches applied. Um, when something like this comes out, it's a race against the threat actors. Uh, they know that there's uh, issues with organizations when it comes to downtime to have to take something offline to patch it. It's always that dance between that the organizational uptime and security patching, and they know that, and they want to race to the administrators to go ahead and make those exploits uh, before they get the chance to patch it. Uh, so for this section, I think Josh mentioned it uh, quite a few times is, you know, we need to patch our systems as soon as possible. Uh, part of that is, is being aware that your system needs patched. Uh, so subscribing to uh, threat bulletins or bulletins for the vendor uh, that allow you to get, you know, information as quick as possible. Um, it kind of kind of reminds me of the saying, you don't have to be faster than the bear. You just got to be faster than the, the slowest person. And that kind of goes back to the, the low-hanging fruit part. Uh, is if you can get your systems patched and you can you know, have proper network segregation and good um, network hygiene, you're less likely to be attacked because it's just more difficult. Not that you won't, uh, just makes it more difficult. So um, using a firewall with uh, IPS and other UTM functions, um, patching your systems as soon as you can, uh, it, it's a difficult. And that's, that's one of the difficulties with, with security. And you know, I've seen it as a network admin um, it's not just as easy as going out and patch your system. Uh, sometimes there's things in your way. So anything you can do to improve that hygiene or mitigate that threat uh, is helpful. Uh, and then disable unused services. I mean, 1.3 million uh, SMBs that are open to the internet is a uh, really low hanging fruit for, for, a, for a threat actor. And they're just gonna scan those IPs uh, and they're probably not going to do it. A script's going to do it. So they, you know, they're, they're sitting on their couch and waiting for something to pop uh, that they could potentially go and exploit. So just following these these simple rules here: uh, patching our systems, uh, using a firewall with UTM functions, staying up to date on the security bulletins for the vendors that you have, especially if you know um, that particular service is exposed externally, uh, and then disabling those unused services. So one thing we wanted to do here, um, we go a little bit more in depth in the actual uh, threat report. So please, if you do have a moment, you know, take a look at it when we wrap up with the webinar here. But uh, we wanted to start kind of doing some focus on uh, different industries and kind of rotate through the threat actors and maybe what their motivations are and, and why they do attacks. Um, so one of the biggest ones out there right now when it comes to a ransomware gang is by far Conti ransomware. Uh, they were the top offender when it came to uh, victims posted to their exploitation site in 2021. And uh, they're pretty notorious for, for not having any rules. Some ransomware gangs may say, you know, we're not going to target healthcare, we're not going to target government because they don't want the extra attention. They don't want to be a headline. They don't want the law enforcement pressure. Conti has clearly come out numerous times and have stated that they're, they're big game hunters. They're going for anyone who they can get a payout for. Um, they typically utilize spear phishing and brute forcing, as we were just talking about here too. And they also utilize what's called initial access brokers. So basically a threat actor goes out, they gain access to a network, whether they did spear phishing or brute forcing or whatever the circumstances are. And they decide either they don't have the technological skill level or they don't want to go any further into this network because they don't want to get in trouble, but they have access. So they'll sell that to a group like Conti Ransomware. Um, and then they're also utilizing and looking for those new, brand new exploits. Um, Conti is very, very organized uh, to the point of where their organ is like a company. They, they have tier structures within their organization. They have tier one folks who don't have a lot of uh, threat actor hacking experience. They bring them in and they have internal documents like wikis and, you know, uh, a support system to help them make this hack happen. And if they can't, they can escalate that up to their tier two hackers and so on and so forth until they finally get it done. They've really turned it into a business. Um, 
because of that and how organized they are, that's probably why they've been so successful compared to a lot of the different ransomware gangs. They're very mobile too. They have locations all throughout the world and it's whack-a-mole. It seems like when one of their physical locations gets shut down, they just seem to pop up somewhere else. Uh, Mofeng is another organization that uh, are a cyber espionage group that targets uh, automotive. Um, they are specifically nation state and backed by the government of China. Um, they focus primarily on the interests of the Chinese government. And a lot of times what we'll see when that comes in terms of the automotive industry is intellectual property, uh, competitors of Chinese manufacturers, um, and wanting to know how U.S. or other organizations that are competitors are doing, what are their new developments, how are their, their financials looking, and things of that nature. Um, they will use very specific. A specifically crafted spear phishing emails, which typically utilize VBA agents, which may be cut down here, but they also utilize uh, malicious PDFs. Um, once they can get someone to interact with their document and have that payload downloaded, at that point they typically install remote access Trojans and they try to stay as quiet as possible. You're not going to see them flip a switch and suddenly the entire network's encrypted. They're going to hang out as long as they possibly can and gather as much information as they possibly can. And that's really where threat hunting becomes important to be able to detect those lateral movements in the data exfiltration and things of that nature. One other thing we want to circle around and talk about here when it came specifically to automotive, I want to look back a couple years at a, uh, there was a large automotive company that fell victim to a ransomware attack. Um, the ransomware attack was suspected to start via phishing. And once it did happen, uh, one of the big things to call out here is it was a multi-site um, infection. It wasn't just at the one site that it initially happened at. It spread throughout different uh, geographical sites and as well as different departments. Uh, it ended up causing a large amount of operational outages in downtime. They were down for roughly about a week. And because of that, I'm sure, you know, anyone here can imagine the business impact and the financial impact because of that. So ultimately, the big lesson learned that came from that was that there wasn't a effective network segmentation put into place. There's other things you can look at too, user awareness training, why was the infection initially happened? But ultimately, Justin said it earlier too here, is if things are segmented and, um, it can't allow that ransomware to escape. It's stuck to either one specific department or one specific, you know, at least geographical site. And it doesn't allow it to branch out and cause even more and more damage. So if you're not familiar with how your network is segmented, it's probably a good time to go ahead and take a look and run through that scenario. If this person in this department were to get infected and ransomware were to begin to laterally move, where can it get to and what kind of an impact would that have on your organization? So uh, for conclusion recommendations, uh, you know, we, uh, a, a big part of this is planning. Uh, and like Josh was saying, uh, right before we came to this slide is, is running through the scenarios, planning tabletops are great uh, for figuring out process gaps, uh, for figuring out uh, technology gaps um, that can help identify those things as what if and running through some what if hypothesis um, and trying to figure out where those gaps are. Uh, so the first thing, educate users. I think we've touched on that. Um, taking a layered approach to security, uh, having multiple things in the way, uh, not being uh, that low hanging fruit, uh, pack, patching your tech stack as quickly as possible uh, where we can, where we can't, making sure that we have mitigations in place um, that takes the risk to a level that we're willing to accept. Uh, number four, we're going to update our malware protection. So we're going to make sure all that stuff is up to date. Our EDR is up to date. Uh, our AV solution is up to date. Uh, and the, the fifth one here is uh, segregate the network. And so, you know, it was a great example, the slide before for the ransomware that may have been able to uh, have a lower impact on the business and, and not have to shut down for a week. Um, if the, the network was properly segregated. Uh, one thing I am going to mention that's not on this slide is uh, prioritization of those risks. So which vulnerabilities are most important to me? Which malware should I be uh, you know, most aware of? What threat actors are targeting my organization? And what TPPs are they using in order to um, execute on the kill chain, you know, for, you know, initial access, for lateral movement, exploitation, um, 
you know, data exfiltration. And so, you know, doing a, a process of going through it and figuring that out or subscribing to a service that helps you prioritize your intelligence uh, is very important because we can't do everything. So we, it's, it's better to do what's, what the highest priority thing is uh, to, to keep us from getting infected. All right. Thank you both and for sharing all that uh, great intelligence. So we are right at the top of the hour here um, at the end of our 30 minutes, but we do have a couple of questions. So if you have the time to stay on, we want to answer these real quick for you guys. Um, so feel free to hang on if you can, or if you've got to jump, you can wait for the recording. Um, so looking at the chat here, thanks for chatting in. Um, Thomas had asked, um, to Josh, what was that source you mentioned for the statement about 90% of attacks starting with phishing emails? Uh, that came directly from CISA, the uh, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. Off the top of my head, I want to say it was on their Shields Up campaign page. Um, but regardless, I, without a doubt, that, that came from CISA, and that was here within Q1 that I read that. And Eric had confirmed that, but I just wanted to double confirm for that for Thomas. So thank you. <laughs> um, and then we have Eric asked, uh, he's curious, how does an SMB brute force work? Um, so typically a lot of times what we see as far as for the SMB, a lot of times it's file sharing and things of that nature that are exposed and threat actors that uh, may be attempting to brute force their way into that. But Ultimately, it's over the protocol, and it's still the same type of brute force that you may see used with like SSH, whether that be uh, usernames and passwords and things of that nature. All right. Um, if anyone else has any more questions, we will hang around for a second here. Um, but. Oh, thank you, Thomas. He just dropped that link in there uh, specifically for it. Appreciate you hunting that down for me. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Thomas. Um, it's like someone's typing. Way to not fall for the fish, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> uh. What is the event log malware about from Jim? Event log malware. That doesn't ring a bell right off the top of my head unless we're speaking specifically. Um, could you go a little more into that, Jim? Um, what do you mean by the, the event log? As in, is that a name of a specific malware that you're asking about or uh, about logging specifically as far as malware goes? We'll see if he pops back up here again in a moment. All right, so we have, what kind of DNS attacks do you see? I inherited a Wi-Fi solution with DNS open from our guest Wi-Fi to internal. Uh, I couldn't tell you right off the top of my head um, all the different vulnerabilities that may be out there for that. Um, so what I would do in this situation, if I inherited a Wi-Fi solution with DNS open, uh, first thing I would really start looking at is the underlying technology. What What is the... Um, the vendor that that comes from and things of that nature. And that's where I'd begin my rabbit hole search to see what vulnerabilities may exist out there. Uh, what version is this stuff that I've inherited on and what may it already be vulnerable to and then apply all the newest firmware and patches and things of that nature to, to get it up to date. Uh, hopefully that helps some, Dave. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Dave, for the question. And another question, uh, any recommendation on monitoring my web server logs in one place? I'll let Justin take that one. He's much more uh, when it comes to the architecture side of things than I would be. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, for, for logging in general, we recommend some type of SIM. Um, and that's not just for your web logs. You can collect network logs, firewall logs. You, you want them all in one place. Uh, when you start start having to, to pivot from device to device to try to figure things out, uh, you lose a lot of the context of the information. Uh, so any type of SIM solutions, there are some free solutions out there. Um, 
uh, we provide a solution uh, for a sim. Uh, but you really want to concatenate all those logs together into some sort of uh, sim technology. Uh, not only so you can view that stuff, but so you can also alert on it. So you're not just looking through logs randomly. If something happens that's of interest to you, uh, you can get that information as soon as possible. All right, and then one more here from uh, Lionel. Thank you, Lionel. Have you heard of this hackers hiding malware in Windows event logs? Uh, I have a bit. I can't say that I am the most familiar with the entire circumstances off the top of my head, but I do know there was a bleeping computer article that came out two or three days ago. Um, I do remember them saying that it was a very advanced threat actor and something that they had not seen previously in the wild. Um, but whoever it was that did this was, again, uh, it was custom written and they were very advanced with it. Uh, but it's definitely not a very common uh, tactic that uh, has been really used anywhere. It's one of the first instances anyone's ever heard of it happening. So I don't think it's something that the, um, I guess your average organization at this moment would need to focus on. But I think what it does lend to and shows is how, um, you know, how much these threat actors evolve. They are always figuring out, you know, Windows event logs have been around forever. And just now we're figuring out ways to now drop malicious payloads within it. And so this is one of those things of where cybersecurity is so dynamic and so fluid that we have to keep our finger on the pulse at all times because when just when you think you've got everything covered, they're going to come out with something to start dropping payloads in your event logs. All right, one more we have here. Have you seen many attacks where Python, Go, or other language interpreters, Rust, were the attack vector? Well, I can't say. I'm, I mean, there are Python existed payloads out there, but I don't think I see them very frequently when I go through all of our uh, like fishing boxes and stuff like that, where we collect a lot of samples. Um, by far, the biggest thing um, is that I see is the, the VBA agents, the Microsoft Office files and Excel. And I think one of the reasons why you don't see that as much is because, one, a lot of Windows devices typically don't have Python installed on them, so it's not going to execute. Uh, and then the other piece of it is, is you may see someone um, who they, they get that Python script inside their email box and they just don't know what that is. They're like, well, I'm not going to click that. So they try to lean towards things that your average office users are going to be familiar with when they're building out their, their lures and things of that nature. Python would be way more capable of, of performing some of these different attacks. But um, I just think because of the, the lack of standard user familiarity, if you will, and again, it not being installed on, on the majority of Windows machines out there, um, they typically avoid it. All right, we're gonna take this one last quick question and then go ahead and wrap it up. But if anyone does have other questions, feel free to email us. Um, so Janel asks, how much DNS filter tool can help with phishing attack? Um, if I am familiar with exactly what you mean by DNS filter, if it's basically like a web application filter of where it's getting a feed in from a known list of bad uh, different domains and things of that nature. Um, yeah, it can it can certainly help. Anything that's going to cut down your users from reaching out to a malicious site, and that you can block that at the firewall level, with the web application level. That's great. You know, um, things that we utilize internally. You know, we have those kinds of web application filters in place. Uh, we have updated lists. We use our threat intel feeds and things of that nature to keep us you know up to speed the best we can as these things develop. Um, obviously it's not very difficult to spin up a new domain. Uh, it's not difficult for a threat actor to, uh, shift from that. So you can't just put that in place either and just assume that's going to be the end all be all. Um, there are some different ones out there that may uh, allow you to place some settings that say, you know, if it's a brand new registered domain, you know, also block that. Um, it depends on your vendor specifically for it, but, um, it doesn't ever hurt to have that in place. That's all part of that def uh, defense in depth plan. Thank you, Josh. All right, so we are going to go ahead and wrap it up in the interest of, of time. I thank you all for participating in, in these questions, um, question and answer session here. 
If you do have other questions, please email us at webinars at newspire.com or go ahead and contact us through our website at newspire.com. Um, any thoughts, closing thoughts from either of you, Josh or Justin? No, thank you all very much for your time and coming out. We certainly appreciate you taking time from your day to come see us. Nope, Hopefully see you next time. Yep. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you, everyone. And on behalf of Newspire and our presenters, thank you so much for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Take care, everybody.